indeed. Oh, nice one, nice one. Next. Which couple left their son behind on a trip? <laughs> oh, right. I'm happy that this one, everyone got it. Okay, next question. What river did Jochebed send Moses down in a basket? Maybe the black bolter, I, uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. I think now we are getting into the groove of things. Next question. Which of Abraham's children ran away with his mother? Tricky or not? Oh, I'm, I'm loving this. Okay, next question. Now it's really about speed as well. Which of Jacob and Rachel's children was first? This, 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 should, be, this should be a quick one was first sent to Egypt as a slave. Fantastic. Oh, 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 we, we had a casualty there, but that's fine. <laughs> Jeremiah was the son of Hilkiah. True or false? That's a tough one. But let's see how our families do. True or false? And... Okay, we missed one, but most people got that. Okay, next question. Which of King Saul's sons disobeyed him? Fantastic, we got, we got that right. Next question, we are almost there. What was the name of Sarah's only son? Now this one, quick fingers, quick fingers. Good. Oh, that's great. Okay. And then how many daughters were born to Jacob? <laughs> Did I hear 12 from the back there? Jo Jacob and his 12 daughters. Okay. <laughs> okay. Awesome, okay. And then we are left with the last three. Who were Timothy, Timothy's mother and grandmother? I, I like the answers I'm getting from here. Yes, yes, we are, the Branfuls have it covered. And then we are down to the last two. How many children did Ezekiel have? This is a tricky one. This is a tricky one. <laughs> How many children did Ezekiel have? Wow. Oh, wow. Oh, oh, wow. This is, this, this is good. Everybody got it right. Yes, he had none. Okay. Next. True or false? Jochebed was the mother of Miriam, Aaron, and Moses. True or false? Du -du -du dun 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 Okay, and then we are done to the last, last question. Who was Simon Peter's brother? Who brought him to Jesus according to John's gospel? Was it Andrew? Was it James? Was it John? Was it Philip? Dun, dun, dun. Okay we should be done. So let's go to next and see the leaderboard mm -hmm. and see the podium. So the Vanderpoys come in third. Let's give them a hands of applause. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, that was very quick. So the 
Randfalls were second, and of course the McCarthy's win this. And uh, and and I I think this was ice, an icebreaker, but we took the ice literal, so it was a lot of hard work. Thank you, families, for uh, indulging us and going through this, and uh, for the audience as well. You've been awesome. Thank you very much. We continue. Okay. So thank you very much, Michael, for that. Um, I'm going to plant myself here, just to make it easier for everybody else. So having warmed up a little, <laughs> now I'd like to address each one of us a little more differently. I, for each of us, I would like to know how long you've been married, and in terms of parenting, what your views are. So. If you're not a parent here, that's fine. You still have use, we'd like to know. So just let's, for, I'll start with the Makatis and then it will go like that. For each of us, let us know how long you've been married and then what are your views on parenting generally? Okay, so thank you. Makatis? Yes, we've been married plenty years. <laughs> uh, 1999. Oh, wow. How many years that, 23? So how many years exactly is that? I'm trying to calculate. 23. 23. Oh, wow. Yes. I was very small. <laughs> <laughs> so what are your views on parenting? Your views on parenting. Wow. Where should I start? My views on parenting. I'd like to know what my daughter thinks about how we have parented. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Okay. Um, okay, so views on parenting, like from my point of view as a child. Yes, yes. Um, okay, so one thing I'll say to summarize everything is um, I think um, our parents created a conducive environment for growth as Christians, and I'll give an example. So with something like music, right? Um, we grew up listening to gospel music, grew up listening to CC Winans, BB Winans, BTC, I mean, like all the greats in um, gospel music. And so um, that was sort of imbibed in us such that we grew to have the love for it. And that also, I guess, I mean, apart from us getting our gifts, musical gifts from them, um, that also helped train our ears. So we all play instruments and then some of us sing as well. So uh, that's one thing I'll say. Okay. Very interesting. Thank you. All right. So I, I think um, my view of parenting is to create an environment where the <laughs> children can flourish and grow. Not not so much as to, um, always to give instructions, but to create the environment within which the kind of growth that you require happens. Thank you very much. Okay. So over to you. For us, uh, we've not married for that long. But uh, it has been just six years now, okay. continuing counting, and we are not parents yet, hoping very soon by the will of God. Sure. And my view on parenting is simply mm, making, as my brother said here, yeah, you make an enabling environment that children can grow in to become what they really want to be in this world. Okay. Thank you very Thank you. much. So, Brantfalls, please. Some turn? Yes, please. Oh, okay. Well, today is uh, 3rd of August, yes, right? Please. Yes, please. So, um, two days ago, we celebrated, not the two of us. <laughs> <laughs> she is my first daughter, okay. named after my mother, so sometimes she bullies me. <laughs> But two days ago was Please. when we celebrated our 41st. Wow. 41st. Oh, wow. Wedding. Please. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so, wow. Uh, That's a huge inspiration. We are veterans in the business. <laughs> yes. Uh, and uh, as for parenting, I think we should leave it to the children and their husbands and so on to tell us what we've managed to do <laughs> um, right for them. Because uh, as 
three generational families. Uh, we have about 17 people all together. Wow. You saw earlier on <laughs> half, half, <no> half <laughs> or two, two thirds of, of, of the contingent. So we want to thank God for all the blessings over the 41 years and counting. Uh, parenting. <laughs> Okay, um, we've been married for 13 years. Wow. Um, parenting. My parents were strict, especially my mom. <laughs> <laughs> um, my dad was flexible, but I mean, so in all, I picked a bit of both, um, which I'm using, uh, we are using to raise uh, our kids. Thank you very much. And then finally, we have the Vanderpoy. Hi. So we've been married for 10 years. Um, so my views on parents, I think it's similar to Essie. I grew up in um, a family where my mom was very, very strict. And she was basically the one who controlled everything in the house. So I think I'm, I'm used to that kind of parenting. But my husband is... Um, a little more laid back, a little more relaxed. So there's a bit of balance. But in everything, I mean, there's no book by which you can say you have to do one, two, three to be a good parent. But there are some principles that you, you just um, follow. And overall, it should be about raising your children to glorify God. In the end. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so I, I'm curious, okay, um, like I said earlier, you are examples of families that are of particular interest to many of us here, mostly because we see you together. You're involved in pretty much everything. And with the Brown Falls, I think it's safe to assume that with every program or anything that's going on, there's at least one representative of each generation somewhere in there. It's like no service or event. There's always a representative somewhere here. So. I guess for most of us, okay, the thing we want to know is, as a family, how have you been able to practicalize, you know, Christianity? Because we, we, I mean, we go to work with people, we have friends, and we don't see that examples or, or in many of our friends out there and colleagues, you get it. So I guess we're, we're curious to know, as a family, how, how have you been able to stay so compact, you get it. There are examples where, um, let me use my own family, okay? I think I'm the only representative here right now, okay? My dad goes somewhere else, my mom goes somewhere else. I mean, we're all in the faith, but you, it's like you guys found some code and just replicated it throughout the years. And it's, it's very beautiful to watch and we are just encouraged by all of that. And we just want to know, as Christians, okay, how did you, for instance, Michael, how, how were you able to raise your children? I know you said you created an environment for them that helped them to feel at home, at ease, and express themselves, but just share with us a few experiences, what it was like watching them grow and see them becoming beautiful people in church, always active, having money to stay focused. Just share with us. I think that um, for Georgia and myself, the, the principle was that we needed to guide the children and move them in the way that they should go. Um, because the Bible says in Deuteronomy that we should teach them, we should show them, we should not just leave them to go their own way and feel that they should be what they want to be. No, we're supposed to teach them what they are supposed to know. And um, it says we should teach them in the way that they will go so that when they are grown, they will not depart from that way. And so we had resolved very early that we were going to focus very much to keep them um, on a track within the word of God and within the confines of um, what the Lord had given to us. Um, and then when they get to 18, 20, they can also take their own decisions based on the foundational principle that we had taught. And so I think that that was very important. That is not the teaching now for a lot of families. 
that you're allowed to do whatever you want and you go whichever direction you want to go. But I don't think that's how we, the way we thought was that we should guide them in the way they should go and teach them how, how, how it should be and then they can take their decisions. At the same time, we gave adequate room for creativity. So for example, for um, um, Christelle, who is sitting with me now, uh, Christelle is very artistic and very um, creative and she always liked to write on the wall and, um, and draw and, and do something on the wall. And so we said, okay, that's the whole house. So we are giving you this stretch of wall from here to there. You can write with pencil, marker, paint, scratch it, whatever you want to do, but that's your stretch of wall, but don't touch any other stretch of wall. And I don't know how whether she remembers that, but for us as parents, it was very interesting to see because she really made use of that wall. Oh, wow. You so see, she and stayed she with the wall. She stayed to, uh, within that wall. So wow. she was, so it was like she had enough space to be creative and do whatever she wanted to do without we always saying, hey, don't touch the wall, don't touch the wall. Um, so, yes, we gave her the guidance to be, okay, this is where you're supposed to be, so focus on that. And at the same time, I still gave her the room to express her um, artistic uh, um, ability. I don't know how she sees it, but. Wow, <laughs> some of us are paints are crying, so. <laughs> Oh, wow. Okay, so I'm going to jump to Dr. Branford because I'm curious to know, 41 years, I mean, <laughs> there have been different sizes and temperaments in there and all. H how did you do it? Um, how did I, how did I stay how did together <laughs> with my wife for 41 years? And raise your children and, and make them such yeah. fine examples for us to follow. Um, hmm. I think ultimately it's the grace of God because my career life has been with the foreign ministry and uh, half of my working life was away from, from Ghana. Oh, wow. So um, out of the, how many years? Yeah, like the 30 plus years, let's say about 15, 16 of those years were, you know, were spent out of Ghana. So basically, my wife has been the anchor with her children. Um, some were saying she was very strict and, and so on, but uh, I wonder if she hadn't exerted that kind of influence in their lives, uh, how things would have turned out and so on. So a, a lot of the parenting in my case was through the... Oh, okay. Um, hmm. It had to be a balance between... Your, yes. Um, I had to strike a balance between um, wanting to give them the best and then also letting them know that you can't have everything. Um, I had to play the role of a father and a mother most of the time. So as she said, I was uh, the, yesterday they were telling me, they gave me a name yesterday, that I, I was a jata in the family. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but um, it was through prayers, you know, um, teaching them what to do, what not to do, wake up in the morning. You know, we had set time for everything. Saturdays, for instance, was a, because I was a full-time um, worker, I was working, we normally cooked on Saturdays. We normally cooked on Saturdays. So Saturdays, we wake up about 5.30 in the morning, they start cutting onions. <laughs> so they were telling me that they cut onions that would feed Ghana and Ivory Coast. I said, that's what you are, you are, you are leading your lives with now. So that's it, you know, everybody, all hands on deck, everybody had a part to play in the kitchen, in the hall, cleaning the house, everything. You know, they, everybody took part. Um, the first two, especially, I think I was maybe, as they were saying, a bit hard because I had to get it right with the first two so that, you know, they can also help with the younger ones. I think um, the one who got off you know, with um, 
she got off lightly, was the baby of the family. <laughs> yes, but um, I don't know what they would say to the kind of parenting that I would like them to also share their views of how we parented them. Thank you. Any, anybody in the Brunfall family wants to share something? <laughs> okay, there's a volunteer. Okay, so we are talking about parenting, daddy and mommy's parenting. Um, yes, yeah, so like mommy has said, mommy was a strict one. Mommy was the one you couldn't get um, away, I mean anything, uh, how do we put it? You couldn't get away with things when it came to mommy. Um, daddy was quiet, he was calm, but he was also strict. I mean, he also had his, his ways, but he was, he was a calmer one um, that we liked to get along more with. You know, that's what mommy, we were just afraid of mommy. You didn't want to get in her way. You didn't want to do the wrong thing for mommy to, to complain. Um, but I think that growing up and now having children of my own, I don't think I would have had it any other way. I think they've both done very well for us. I mean, there were many years when daddy wasn't here and mommy had to step in. You know, and once daddy was here, you knew he was here. You know, so I think that looking at us now, we didn't turn out too badly. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, they've, 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 done, they've done very well with us. Thank you very much. Please let's put our hands together for that. Okay, so there's actually a lot coming out of this little interaction. Because, for instance, um, sorry, Mommy, Mrs. Banfo, I, I think I would like to come back to you Again, and it's because you touched on something that I think some of us go through. It's the subject of single parenting. You know, um, you're still married, but then you sharing your life's experiences with us lets us know that there's been a time when it felt like you had to hold everybody going. I, I just want you to shed a bit more light on what it's like and just to encourage somebody who finds themselves in that situation because I know, we, we know friends who sometimes they just feel like the whole world is against them and they ask themselves questions, did I get it right, am I doing this right? I'm a woman, how can I be the father? How, how did you go through it? What, what are some of your secrets? There were no secrets really. Um, I, I, felt, I felt back on what, or how I was brought up. Uh, my parents, how my dad and my mom, they were together forever, and they brought us up together. So I knew what was expected of um, a parent. If the father is around, what he should do for the children. If um, he's not around, what I can do to step in, you know. So, and, and sometimes um, I, I went back to him. I, I consulted him on some of the things, um, issues that were going on, you know, with us. Uh, we, we, we talked, we talked, even, I'm, even though I'm here and he's away, we talked, we discussed, and um, that, that's, the way, that's the only way I thought, you know, we could deal with the situation, me alone with the girls. And um, my, my parents also helped, they were alive then, they were alive then, so if there was any situation that I, I couldn't handle, I could call them, Wig was not around, my dad was there, he could step in. I remember that um, they lived in a central uh, place in Laboni. My parents lived in Laboni. So um, I dropped the children off in school. I dropped the children off in school in the morning. Then my father's driver went around the schools, you know, with my other siblings and their children. They picked all the kids up. The driver picked all the kids up took them to my mom's house, you know, she would feed them. They went with their clothes, they change their feet, they do their homework, my parents supervise them. And then at the end of the day, I go and I pick them up. So it was, it was I had the, what do you call it? The support, the support from my, my parents. Yes. Thank you very much, at least that's some encouragement for our friends who may be 
in such situations. Um, and, and if I may sorry. Ask, um, I think single parenting of, you know, a, a proper single parent mm -hmm. is different from single parenting from circumstances okay. of the kind that we, we had. Because I'm sure that um, as and when, I mean, the family looked forward to reuniting with me, for instance, and sharing some time with me wherever I was, which would have been different from, you know, a proper single parent who <laughs> has to, you know, handle everything by themselves, all yeah. by herself or himself. So I, I, I thought I would make that, that point. Okay. Thank you very much for shedding some light on that. Matiko, do you have any thoughts on that? I seem to have a lot in common with the Brownfield family. So I think when it comes to parenting, um, a lot of us learn from our parents, from our experience when we were growing up. So that's what we fall back on because that's what we are, we are used to. That's where we grow up. That's where our experiences come from. So I also grew up in a very strict um, home. My mom was the one who was around most of the time. My dad was usually at work. So I, I think even in, in my, back then, of course, I thought she was a bit too strict. We used to be afraid of her. Coincidentally, we used to think that she was a lion just like the brown holes. But it's now that I appreciate what she was doing. It's now that I appreciate why she was doing the things she did. And I think she was trying to instill in us some principles. And it's helped us, every single one of us in our lives. And so I appreciate her for that. So um, I try to do the same with my children. But you know sometimes in parenting, you also look at some of the mistakes your parents made and you want to improve upon it. You always want to strike a balance between being strict and still being able to allow them to feel free to come to you with their issues and stuff. So that's where the problem is, balancing, being strict. You know, they shouldn't come to a point where, sometimes you want to be our children's friends, but they must also know that we are their parents. There's a time for everything. So there's a time to be strict, there's a time to be friendly, and they should be able to distinguish when, I mean, it's time for each. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Yanyi Ampa, any thoughts to share with us on this one? For now, I think uh, no, really, because uh, as you know the situation, we are yet to raise children. Although we have experience from our niece, seeing them growing up and how it is, but it starts not really being as, as first-hand experience. So we are yet to really go through that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, my next question has to do with um, practicing or fostering love and unity. As a family, how have you been able to foster love and unity amongst everybody? So, Dr. and Ms. McCarthy, would you like to start for me? Okay. Um, so there are a number of things, but I'll just speak about one. Um, so. I think one thing that we do um, as a family that um, fosters love and unity and ensures that um, everyone feels comfortable with each other and you know has fun aside the life of work and school is um, we usually have family game nights. So um, these are nights where um, everyone is free. No one has any online meeting or anything of the sort. <laughs> um, where we play games like bingo, Monopoly, Scrabble. And um, I think with that, we, we, we get to learn as we are playing the games. We get to interact, we get to laugh, um, tease one another once in a while. And I think those times that we've um, taken aside to have those moments of um, fun and learning at the same time has been one of the things that has been able to keep us together as um, a family of unity and love. That's what I'll see. Thank you. Okay. Um, as a couple, as a family, we try to do things together. 
especially tidying up the house during weekends and going to church. He is not a full member of Rich Church, but we agree to sometimes come to Rich. Sometimes I go to his church together, but very soon maybe he'll, he'll become a Rich <laughs> member because he, <laughs> because he enjoys the Bible studies that we used to do. And we try to um, go for an, um, holidays. If there's holidays around, we go for to go and relax somewhere. Oh, we wow. do things together to keep us and pray together most of the time. And we normally do our evening devotion. We don't, we don't normally do the morning devotion because of the time to go to work and all that, but we try to do it in the evening before we go to bed. And I think that's the things that keeps us going. If I have to add this, it's also by the grace of God that we are still together because uh, love keep us. It's love that is keeping us. And, and, and though sometimes, yes, we feel like we are doing everything to be together, but sometimes we feel like, oh, it's not our strength. It's just the <laughs> grace of God that is keeping us. Yeah. So I think it's all boiled down to God. It's God that is really keeping us. Okay. Um, Peter, Yanyampe said something very interesting. They, they do vacations together. They find a way to bond together. Coincidentally, we are at the brand force. I'm wondering how whether all of you ever did that, because I, I personally I have grown up with a big family as well. Sometimes it's easy for any of us to just feel lost and unattended to and all of that. But I think vacations are something that can really help us all to bond. The few times we did it, it really helps. I'm, I'm curious, what was that like for you? Okay, so for us, as Mami said, um, our grandparents were central for us. And with our grandparents, all mommy's um, siblings and children. So we all used to go to our grandmother and we, oh. we had that bond. So we've tried to carry that along amongst the four of us and then our husbands. So you'll find that maybe on a weekend, mommy will call and say, aren't you guys coming over? You all should come over. And then we end up um, at mommy's, mommy and daddy's and we spend the day together. And so we've done that over the years and then our children, we, we, we bring them together so that they get to know each other and grow together. Okay, that's a nice one. Um, there's, there's also a theme coming up as we go along. Um, today, currently, okay, in 21st century, this world, the idea of always spending time together on that scale, I don't seem to see, this is personal, I don't seem to see it happening that much. Okay, from where you sit and your experiences, what's your take on how we are handling our families? Not just, um, let's say, my husband and my children, but in your case, you, sa you said something very interesting that this goes beyond just your unit. It's about my sister's children, my brother's children, it's about all of us, and grandma is even demanding, won't you come, and all of that. Sometimes grandma is asking, we are not coming. You have been through it. Would you, would you say it's very, very relevant in today's time to keep doing that, spend time together? Would it, would it help? It is. I, I believe it is because we learn from each other. Um, I learn a lot from my sisters. <laughs> I learn a lot from my brother-in-laws. I mean, we are all learning. The children learn from each other. Um, we're able to encourage the, the children. For me, for instance, my nephew, Niakwe, he, had, he came and said um, he, had, he, had, he didn't do too well in some of his exams. And I said, listen, let's put in more effort. You know, let's study harder. Let's see where it will take us. And he came back, and he, he got good grades that term. And it made me very proud. I was like, if I can have that conversation with him and these are the results that we'll get in, we might as well continue like that. So we need to have that amongst us. Okay. Matigal, please, do you have any reactions? Okay. 
should I do them before coming to okay? So we have some reactions from the Branfo family. Please, who goes first? Okay. Hi, Paco here. So this is my perspective from the outside coming in. So while I was getting to know Irama, um, I was exposed proper to the Branfo family, Branfo and allied families, let me put it that way. And I wasn't used to large family gatherings, regular parties, uh, there's a function every Saturday, every other Saturday, and it was a lot for me initially. But with the, with the years, I've really come to appreciate how important these family gatherings are. It's really crucial, it's good for the mental health, um, it's good for bonding, and I intend to inculcate it in my nuclear unit as well. So I appreciate and I have appreciated the importance of regularly meeting, not just with your immediate family, but with everybody. They invite everybody. I mean, it got to a point where I felt mommy could even start a, a rent, renting business, renting chairs, because there are so many chairs. So I just want to say that it's important to meet regularly as a family and as a large family. We shouldn't leave the practices that our forefathers had behind and just adopt westernized culture to our detriment. Thank you. Thank you, so we'll come back to the Van der Poys. Okay, so um, I, we also grew up in a, in a family where celebrations were important. So my mother always made us a point to um, celebrate all our birthdays, celebrate Easter, celebrate Christmas, and it had to be celebrated as a family. So I think she's kind of instilled us in us. She, she's, because we've, even she's passed, but we've carried it on. Like we meet, we celebrate everybody's family, my sisters, my brothers, their children, everybody's birthday is celebrated. It's always a, a chance to get together and it keeps us together. We enjoy each other's company. As she said, we learn from each other. And life is stressful, so it's also a way of distressing and keeping up with each other and knowing what's happening in each other's life. So with me, my sister lives close to me, so it's kind of simple. I can virtually walk to her house, and she's like my support system. Her husband picks my children from school. They spend a lot of time in her house. So I don't know, we've, we've kind of continued what we, we were taught. And with my husband's family too, they are a little bigger than ours, but they are also into celebration, like birthdays, Christmas, you know, so we meet, we're always meeting, and it helps us to keep that family bond going all the time. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now, I want to touch on something slightly different. Um, what else might you do together to help to keep everyone interested in walking with Jesus? Yes. Apart from um, family meetings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, what, so else, what else do you think we can do to help keep everyone in your family interested in Jesus? Well, I think praying. Praying together as a family is important. Um, I must admit, we're not very consistent with it. So, um, so for example, like we try to do morning prayers every morning. And sometimes when we miss it at home, I pray with the children in the car. So that's what we try and do. We try to come to church all the time. But I think praying is what keeps us together and uh, keeps the children also, it also builds a habit of prayer in the children as well. Like you are teaching them something, they learn by example. So if you are doing something all the time, it becomes natural to them without actually having to force it down their throat. It just becomes a natural part of them. So I think prayer is important. Okay. Anybody wants to share anything else? What else can we do? Hello? Okay. Okay, hi. Um so I think we can you can add um we can add um like Bible study together or Bible quiz like a time that we we'll all just come and sit and then say, Oh, we are Let's say we give a book, like, oh, we're doing a study on Matthew, then at the end of the month or something, we will have a quiz. I feel like that will bring us together. Yeah. 
Thank I'll, you very I'll like much. To add to that one. Okay. There, um, one of the things we have done is to use um, version Bible app, um, which which um, helps us to see what the other family members are reading. And so you see when Nelma, Nelma completes a reading or a plan, you see it. When Christel, you know, posts a verse, you see it. Kind of um, letting everybody see what the others are doing, and and studying the Bible through such an app. Um, in the recent years, I found that quite interesting. As the children have grown older, um, you can kind of interact uh, in that. A few plans we've tried to read together, but. Um, mm -hmm. I think the wavelength is a bit different in some of the things we want to read. So, um, but but using that app, I think it's a nice thing for families to to use. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's very interesting. Anybody else want to share anything? Just just to add to what he's saying. I mean, I use that app myself, and the the good thing about that app too, it has um, a section for kids. So um, when you, it gives you a verse every morning. It gives you a verse, and then there's a preaching, and then there's a devotional with it. You can post the verse for the day. And then there's a kid's version. So you can go through, it's like two minutes. So you can go through with the kids. So sometimes you do it, but like I said, work, and so the, the problem is with consistency. But it has a, a portion for kids where you can just take them through. It has a verse as well that they can learn. And then someone just talking about what the, the verse is and giving a short devotional. So it's, it's very helpful, the U version. It's in Google Play. OK, that's, that's interesting. It, on that note, in this internet age, OK, for instance, this is the first time I'm hearing that U version can actually do all these things. I just read my Bible, and then that's it. I know sometimes you can get audio on it, but I didn't know it could do all this, but I'm just curious, in this internet age, okay, what else can we do? Because um, there's a risk that if you indulge too much with internet devices, it could go southward, because if you leave them and they end up on sites that you can't monitor for, I'm just curious, what are your views on it? Sure. Okay, um, so I'll share something that I think helped um, us. Um, so one thing um, our parents did was they didn't give us phones early. So we didn't have access to, I mean, we had access to the internet, yes, but then like you don't have a device that is personally yours that you can use at any time. And at that point, I thought it was quite unfair because I would go to school and my friends would be talking about what they are posting on Facebook, et cetera, on YouTube and all of that. But then growing older, like when I got into my teens, um, I now understood why they did that. And the reason I believe is, was that um, they wanted us, like we said earlier, to they created that environment where um, it's not just about saying, don't do this or do this, but then showing by example and leading such that um, when you grow, you as a child can say, okay, this is right for me and this is not right for me. So I think that was one of the things that was very um, helpful for us. So we're not exposed too early. And even when we were exposed and we had our phones and all of that, um, you would know that, okay, this is wrong for me to watch or this is wrong for me to, to look at. Um, even though it didn't go like that all the time, um, because we are also, there's also that openness. You can go and talk to them about, um, okay, maybe you're not sure about this particular um, app, or you're not sure about this particular site or what's not. There's that openness for you to go and talk about it. So I think that's what I'll say. I would also like to add that um, um, for the younger ones, um, my phone is shared with, the, with one of my family members. <laughs> so um, that family member also has her folders on my phone. and. Anything she wants to do is on my phone. So um, she's learning negotiation skills. Um, and uh, we're using the phone together somehow. Uh, so she's learned not to, for example, things like, yeah, well, you don't run down the battery and then uh, come and put the phone down. Um, you have to be responsible for the battery uh, level as well. You have to be responsible for where you go, because wherever you go, I can also see. Also, wherever I go, she can also see. So it actually goes both ways um, to have that kind of interaction. So it makes us interact a little bit more. And we have to decide, so who is going to use the phone now? 
you know, and it, it, it sometimes can get quite interesting. And uh, maybe she will want to comment if she wants to. <laughs> she say no. So, so on that score, then how do we handle conflict in this modern day? Back then, you, your mother says one thing, you don't say anything. Your father looks at you one way, you understand. I'm telling my four-year-old to stop. He said, no, mommy, you stop. You understand. She will add, you stop to it. So that arrangement is very interesting, but I can also imagine how there may be some back and forth. She may want this, and it may not be easily understood by her and all of that. I'm just curious. In this modern age, how do we handle conflict as a family? This one, I think I'm going to go to Mrs. McCarthy. Um, conflict. Um, I don't think we've had a lot, a lot of uh, conflicts. Um, I, I, I can't seem to remember. But um, as Michael said, an environment has been created, and so like we know that everybody knows what they are expected to do. So you hardly um, fall into any trap. Let me put it that way. Uh, I don't know what that man said. I mean, we, we don't have much conflicts. <laughs> yeah, basically. Okay, so let's look at it this way. How do you handle the situation when you feel, or have you ever been in a situation where you felt like your, your child just doesn't understand you? You are, the thing is so clear, you are explaining it to your child, but for some reason, he or she just doesn't understand. You get it? And, and the reverse is also applicable. Have you ever felt like, I, he's going on and on about something, but I, I just can't seem to relate. You get it? And out of that lack of understanding, let me put it, all kinds of reactions start coming up. And if most of the time, if we don't handle it carefully, then you have some kind of banter happening that ideally shouldn't even have started in the first place. So what are your views on that as well? Anybody can take this. OK, so let me try and answer it. So I think it's important to know the temperaments of your children. For example, um, my two boys are very, very different. The first one is the older, so sometimes I expect certain things of him. I expect him to take initiative so that he sets an example to keep the second one in check. But unfortunately, he's the more sensitive one. So a lot of the time, the younger one tends to bully him. So we get to a situation where he's the one who always comes to complain that, so he's Neo Kanta. Neo Tu said this, Neo Tu said that, Neo Tu hit me, Neo Tu did this. And I'm like, you are the older one. Like, you're always trying to get him to stand up for himself, be more confident, exert some kind of authority over the younger one. But then I've come to realize that that's just how he is. You know, I, I, as much as I, I pray and hope that he builds some kind of confidence with time, I also have to appreciate that I mean, this is sensitivity. It's, it's, it can be a weakness, but it can also be a strength in that he's very loving to his brother, very, very loving, very caring, very protective. But of course, yeah, I have to teach him how to be able to stand up for himself because he is the older one, and I expect him to set examples you know, that the older one can look up to. So if, let's say, the, the, the younger one can look up to, the younger one is doing something, I expect him to be able to stop him or to say no because, but sometimes you have him joining in <laughs> and making the whole situation. And when you go and you try to ask why he hasn't kept him in check, he's just looking at you, he's about to cry. But um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's all about knowing each of them and their temperaments and being able to handle them. It's not always easy, but you have to know how to handle them. The younger one is very feisty. He's the one who will talk, he will, if you say something, he will talk back to you, he'll have a whole, negotiation. So something happened in school. For example, recently, um, I went and someone said um, he had been reported to the teacher. So we went and apparently they, they had seen him running. So the person had told him to stop running, like, so otherwise he would fall. So the person had taken him to his teacher to go and report to him. 
posted a teacher that he was being disobedient because I asked him to stop and he didn't. So the teacher said, oh, they asked you to stop running. Why didn't you stop running? And he was like, oh, I was stopping <laughs> when, when she saw me. And you see, that's somebody, it's very hard to, to win an argument with him because it's possible that it's true. He was running. You said stop. At a time that she saw, I was stopping. But that's just how he is. And that teacher appreciated that, oh, that's him, you know. And she was like, oh, he'll probably grow up to be a politician or a lawyer or something, stand his ground. But I was like, I don't know. They all have different temperaments. So you just have to know how to handle them, how to be able to be able to nurture them. When they were younger, when they are younger, it's, it's hard to get them to understand what it is you are trying to, 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 to um, tell them. So you put all these rules, you try to get them time out, you try to get them punishments so that they learn. I think that you, you shouldn't get frustrated when it seems like you're not making headway. With time, as they grow older, you are better able to negotiate things with them. They are better able to understand what it is that you are trying to explain. Like for example, right now, neocancer is nine. If I'm having a discussion with him about something, it's, it's a lot better than when he was five or four. So with time, as you keep doing the same thing, they learn by example, and they learn from you. For example, if you give them a room to not do something, and then you do it, they are very quick to point out to you that you are doing the very thing that you said they shouldn't do. So you, you have to keep trying to enforce whatever it is you are trying to get them to do, and be an example yourself, because they pick up a lot from you. Okay, thank you very much. Any other reactions? Randfalls, anybody? So I, I have a, um, my situation is similar to hers because I have an older one who is calm and then a younger one who is, I, I call her uh, Ganyobi because <laughs> I keep telling her that she has the gun version. Um, so sometimes you'd expect the older one to say, if I stop what you're doing. But when, you, when they get into trouble and ask, ah, but mommy, if I was doing so, we all did it together, you know. So yes, but um, you, should know, you should know their temperament and how to discipline them. So for my son, for instance, I can scold him and you get the point. But for Ifa, the, probably the cane will come out. <laughs> you know, so it's, you, you, you find the balance. You, you, you get to know them as they grow older, and then you find the balance. So um, for this is, I think, going to go more to the families with older um, children in there. Would you say that parenting gets easier as the years go by? even when your children are all grown, having children, and you see all of them making their mistakes and all of that, is it, is it easier for you? Um, uh, I want to make a confession that we went over the, the questions yesterday uh, as a family, and when we were discussing this particular topic, <laughs> Um, I think two, two versions came up. Some felt that, yes, parenting got easier. But the other version was that parenting changed. At, at every point, the challenges are different. Um, it doesn't necessarily make it easier. It, it opens different opportunities and so on. So maybe what you did not, uh, how you did not approach a particular issue before at a certain age. Um, years on, you're approaching it with a bit of maturity and so on, but the dynamics in its, you know, the, dy the dynamics would have changed. So um, the approach to, to the particular issue is different, and that might make it appear as if it is easier. But not necessarily so, it just is, is different. At every level you have, you have uh, different, different challenges to confront. Uh, and maybe that's the interesting thing about um, a situation like you being a parent. 
<laughs> you know, you, <laughs> you, you, you confront different uh, aspects of life as, as you age. Yeah. Okay. Do you have any experiences that you can share, any, any of you? Maybe with one particular child, because I remember Martika was saying that when um, New Doe was younger, it used to be a certain way now. Do you, do you have any experiences like that so that okay, we can so, um, picture it? For me, um, when I was stubborn, okay, Sandy, <laughs> my dad would spank me. Now, when I spank my daughter, my father is warning me not to spank his <laughs> grandchild. <laughs> so so for, for me, that is, that's a bit funny because uh, like you're you saying, it, it, it changes, you know, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Any reaction? Yeah, I'd like to add a little bit. I think exactly what they have said is exactly true, that it changes with time. I think now um, one of the problems of uh, parenting is um, social media and internet usage. And how to parent that is very difficult <laughs> because um, they can easily cut you out of the equation. And um, I think a strategy of a parent um, whose children are at that age is to find a way to engage with them rather than try to fight them. Okay, so we had a policy of environmental creation. And so that included what you could watch and what you couldn't watch. And then now they've escaped that environment and so now the social media, they determine what they want to do. So you can follow them on social media. You can um, listen when they go live with a program and be part of that program because it will alert you that they have gone live. And um, I don't know whether they like that or not. I don't know. We have to ask yeah, them. I was about to say they um, might think they are stalking them. <laughs> um, um, there are other things you can do uh, online, like um, getting, getting, having some partial access to their account. So for example, when we set up email accounts for them, we set them up under my account. Of course, they can set up their own accounts as well and then escape that. Um, but it's interesting to see what they do with their accounts sometimes. We don't go through their accounts per se, but you kind of get a sense of where they stand. Um, I, n now, the kind of music I tend to listen to is not my type of music of Stephen Curtis Chapman and all that, but it's more of, now I'm listening to Limbo Blaze, Preachers, um, what's that other guy? <laughs> you know, listening to people that they listen to. And that is quite interesting. So suddenly you start to get into another sphere of music that maybe you don't even want to listen to originally, but you start to listen to it, you start to understand what is going on in that sphere of music. And when you talk about something, you're able to get into their understanding. I don't think we'll ever get to, you know, really be into what they are getting into. Um, but now they'll be listening to some kind of music, uh, Christian music, yes, but a very different version of what we used to. If I hadn't gotten a little bit into it, I would say, no, no, no you can't listen to that. But now you're getting into it, you realize that, well, maybe the sound of it sounds like something else. But when you go deep into it, who is even the artist? There's an artist that one of my daughters started following quite early on. And so I decided to follow that artist. The very interesting was that the artist was a, a lady. She was single. And she used to talk about singleness and so on. And then she got married and she discusses her marriage journey. And my daughter was also following that um, journey of how she got married, how she met her husband. And this is a Christian musician. So it's interesting to see. And then she starts to talk about marriage, and then she starts to talk about her first child. I found that quite interesting, and, and my daughter is also following that one. And so you kind of see what is their influence, what is influencing her. So when she starts talking about something, I'm more likely to understand where she's coming from because I know the person she's following online, and I'm also following that person. Maybe quite odd, but. Um, getting interested in what they are interested in will partially help in the parenting of, of a, a, an internet age child um, who, is, who, is, who, is, who is into, into other things that we also um, need to understand. Yeah. So Dr. McCarthy, at this point, I'm going to ask that you seem to know a lot of um, 
hacks in this internet age. So if you would just share a few, I'm, I'm saying this because I think for most parents, the younger ones especially, our dilemma really is how to be involved and not necessarily invading their space. You want to know what they are up to. You want to appreciate what it is that they are interested in. You want to be able to communicate with them. But we struggle to find a way to do it so that they don't feel like, oh, mommy, why are you following me around? Why are you listening to my conversations? Why are you checking me out on social media? We don't want to come across as invading their space. And yet, we want to be able to have a safe, a safe angle to which to, you know, we can keep our eye on them. Because earlier, we are saying that the internet is so big, we don't understand everything about it. We, we can't seem, we try, but we can't seem to catch up. But you seem to be navigating it quite well. You mentioned you version. You mentioned something, how you track uh, where they go and all of that. I'm, I'm just wondering, how are you doing all of that? I, I, well, I, I'm not really tracking everything they are doing. At, uh, no, I'm tracking everything you are doing. <laughs> <laughs> but really, you can't track everything that they are doing. But I think it's a matter of interest and also letting them lead. So one of my daughters says, that, ah, no, you need to listen to music on Spotify. I said, oh, what is Spotify? You haven't heard of Spotify. Oh, so what is Spotify? So, oh, no, no. so okay, then, 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 yeah, okay. Then, then set up the account so that I can see. And he said, oh, I can even set up a family account. I said, ah, super. So set up a family account. I'll send the money to you, and then you will set up the family account <laughs> and make me a member, and you are the one who has set up the family account. So you are letting them lead as well. And they are showing you what is going on, or what interests them, or what is important to them. And you also start to listen to your own music, but you can also ask, so what about this? Uh, what are you listening to? Can I also listen? You know, some of you may not find interesting, some of you may find interesting. So maybe just taking interest, real life interest in what is going on, letting them lead you in um, what they are doing and what they are interested in. Um, I, that's my perspective, but maybe, um, maybe Christelle, uh, Nelma um, can also see whether we are, they feel that we are looking over their shoulders too much, or what, I don't know. Anita, Nelma. <laughs> Crystal, will you speak for them? Um, okay. Okay, first, nothing was coming to mind, but something has come to mind. Um, I think, like um, he mentioned, letting us lead, and then the whole point of communication Okay, um, because, yeah, it's not everything that would want our parents involved in, not because we are doing anything bad, but sometimes you just also like to have your space because there's also that generational gap of, okay, you might say, like the music thing, you you are not so interested in Afrobeats because that's not what you grew up with. But then with us, like, that's what's around us, and it's it, it becomes a bit difficult sometimes. But then if there is that conversation, um, happening and as parents you are involved with um, like what, what your child does. So for instance, one thing that my dad does that I really love is um, even though sometimes he gets home late, if we are still awake, he would come knock on your door, come to your room and okay, how was your day? All of that. So there's that communication and interaction. So they are involved in what you are doing, but it's not like they are um, invading your privacy. So I think establishing that, that thing of, okay, yes, I'm your parents, but then I'm also your friend. I mean, the balance, yes, I mean, there are difficulties with finding the balance, but I think if as parents, they are able to um, have that time of um, communication, try to, um, like he said, understand your child's interests um, would be very helpful. And I mean, it differs because as, as they also mentioned, your children are also different with their personalities and what they like and what not. Yes, please. So um, I'm getting this coming across that communication is key. And I would like to use the word intimacy is also necessary because you need to be able, from what I'm getting from everybody, you need to be able to let your child know that they can trust you with the seemingly uncomfortable things, even the things that they feel you may not appreciate very well or question. At least you've made your children feel like it's okay if you are a little different, a little weird with your likes and preferences. 
at least we can have some common ground in there because I see it as that opens the door for your children to be able to now come to you and say, okay, this is my issue. Or that also opens the door for you to now have a conversation with them about why exactly do you like this particular artist? What is it about their music that gets you going and all? And I think it just creates a platform for you to find a nice, healthy way to treat the uncomfortable thing. So that's, thank you for that, because that's one thing that's coming across very clearly to me. Okay, so now I want to find out, how did you know what gifts and talents you had to be able to serve the body of Christ in different ways? Hmm. Who's gonna take this one? Mr. and Mrs. Yenyi Ampa. Mm. I realized that uh, my wife is very, very interested in singing. And uh, with that, when she's interested in singing, what it means is that wherever there's a music or she hear that she wants to be there, and with that, it helps her a lot to, when you find yourself in a choir or in a group that they do such activities, it can be singing, it can be any other activities, evangelism, it can be any other thing. But the most important thing is that when you discover it, you have to find a group, join it, develop it, and it automatically will be a benefit to the human race, like people will benefit from you and that will also fulfill the purpose of God in our life. So talent discovery is just knowing what you love to do and how you can develop it and use it to serve the mankind. Mm -hmm. That's what I see. And uh, she is into it, <laughs> but I am not. <laughs> Renka, so have you always loved to sing? Were you always singing in school, right from school? Or? Um, yes. Um, I started singing when I was in JSS. Um, I joined the school choir. And I love singing a lot. Anytime I hear gospel music. Um, when I was growing up, um, my role models were, was um, Tego Sisters. Oh. I love their songs. So I always pray that one day I'll sing like them. So, <laughs> and I'm happy that I discovered my talent at that um, age. And I still do. And luckily enough, my husband and my father-in-law, my father-in-law was is also um, a musician. So when he comes around, we sing a lot in the house. We disturb him sometimes, <laughs> but he also supports me sometimes when we, uh, he heard of any music program, he just alerts me. There's a music program going on, maybe here or there. Would, are you interested to attend? If I have the free time to, he goes with me, sometimes I go alone, and I think it helps me to a lot. Okay, thank you for that one. But um, you know, talents and gifts come in various forms. I think in church, normally when we say talents and gifts, the very easiest ones are usually those who exhibit it in front of everybody. It's easier to pinpoint those ones, but in, in, in your families, how, how did you come to identify yourself that, okay, perhaps I wanted to be a doctor and there's just something about medicine that, you know, called out to me and I pursued it and I'm doing it as a ministry for the Lord. Any prescription I write down, anybody I diagnose, anybody I'm handling, it's, it's an opportunity for me to let Christ work through me just so I can get to somebody and heal their bodies so that they can also go and make impact somewhere out there. So how did you how did you come to that point? You get it. And I'm particularly interested in, in this other aspect of gifts and talents because um, in our side of the world, not many of us grew up really um, walking the line that we had always wanted to. Perhaps you wanted to paint and somehow you had to go to school and become a mathematician or a chemist or something. You get it. So if you have been able to find what you love and you're doing it, how has that journey been like for you? So Dr. Brownfall. Um, 
Well, I think talent discovery can, can come in, in various ways. Uh, you yourself as an individual may develop a talent or may become aware that you have a talent and then you, you pursue the talent and you, you use it to do things. Uh, um, uh, at some point, uh, I was president of the Men's Fellowship, for instance. Um, I, I got to the point where I thought that um, I, I, could, I could play that role because I felt talented enough to, to do so. Uh, sometimes to, uh, out of a certain situation, you may be reminded that you are talented in a certain way and, and you pursue it. And the example I was sharing was when my wife visited me in, in, in Mali. Mali is essentially a Muslim um, country. But we discovered that there were Christian communities and we were sharing the, the faith and so on. So on this particular occasion, she, she came visiting, we went to church, and then you know that time, oh, who is visiting for the first time? And okay, so she um, gets up and yes, I'm visiting, I'm so and so. Um, I'm telling you, this man, he can play the piano. Get him to become, <laughs> get him to become member of the, of the choral group that we call a semer. So um, I had to go home and try and, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, um, practice and eventually become the organist to the, the group. So. Yeah, talent can, can come in various ways. I think when it catches up with you, your response to it is the more critical thing. That's very interesting. So you can willingly go at it. It can come to you unknowingly, and you can also be seemingly coerced into it. But I think the most important thing is what you just said, that how you respond to it makes all the difference. Dr. Van der Poy, any reactions? Um, okay, so the one example I have is um, Sunday school. So um, initially when I, I had um, the boys, we used to go to church and we used to be in the conference room. There was um, a TV that you could follow the service from. And then they started um, 7.30 Sunday school. So if I, we wanted to go and leave the boys there and then go for the main service. But every time you left them, eventually they would end up coming back to you in the main church. So then I had to be sitting with them through the Sunday school. And then before I knew it, now I was teaching at the Sunday school. And now so I've become a Sunday school teacher by virtue <laughs> of that. So it wasn't something that I knew I had, but now I enjoy it. I enjoy it. I love teaching in the Sunday school. It wasn't something I knew that I could do. But by virtue of the children and having to sit with them at Sunday school, I became a Sunday school teacher. Okay, Norma. Okay, so I think for us, um, we live in a family where my, both my parents used to sing and they still sing. And so I think, so I think that's what created that interest in the three of us that's old, we want to sing or that musical aspect in us. And first, so personally for me, through school, fine Christian school and Christian high, the teachers, they have actually really helped me improve on this thing, the singing. And in Vine Christian School, my music teacher found out that, oh, I can play, like he, he discovered that, oh, I can play saxophone. So he introduced me to the saxophone, and then that's how I started playing sax saxophone. But yeah, it was through my parents singing, and then us admiring that certain aspects of their lives and saying, oh, we also want to be like that. So yeah. That's very interesting. So basically, what you saw in your parents, what, what kind of like lit the interest in you? Okay, so I'm, I'm curious, how would you encourage um, families, those of us who 
perhaps we know what our talents are. Perhaps we know what our gifts are. But there are so many reasons why we, we don't seem to be very active or, or doing much with our gifts and talents. Some of the reasons are that our children are too young. Some, it has to do with the fact that we even work on Sundays. But I see doctors here. I see various professions here. I know there are different professions in there. There are teachers and all. And I'm just curious, how would you advise some of us to be able to, you know, embrace your talents, embrace your gifts, and then use it to serve the house of God? You seem to have found a way. Um, I think it will be helpful for the church as a church to encourage um, self-discovery, you know. Um, I share pews with particular faces week in, week out, and so on. But you may be surprised that um, if you happen to know their names, that in itself is good enough. But you sit with people in the house of God to, to, to pray and, and worship and so on, and at the end of the day, you go away. You don't know who that person is. You know? I think there has to be a way of um, breaking down the barriers between you and your neighbor. And that way, um, through that way, you probably will know who he or she does. And, and uh, maybe indirectly discover the talents and so on that that person may have. Uh, that in itself helps a certain dynamism to grow. Uh, people are too closed in, cloistered in themselves, yeah. and uh, you know. So the, the the talent that they may have is kept within. What we want is an explosion of what people may possess, and then we can utilize those talents in serving you know, the, the needs of, of, of others. OK, um, there's another reaction. Um, I think that there will never really be a good time to start or to use your talents to serve in the house of the Lord. I mean, once you've been able to discover that this is what I'm interested in. You just need to move and take the step. Because, um, so I'll give an example. I started teaching in Sunday school, um, probably when I was in level 100 at the University of Ghana. You know, because I've always loved children and working with children. You know, so there was just a Sunday I came to church and I just decided to go to the Sunday school, to the crash class. I didn't do much for a very long time. I just sat there and watched as the older ladies there did most of the caring for the little ones. But I mean, once you've been able to discover a talent, the best place to practice that talent is the house of God. You know, whether it's singing, whether it's playing an instrument, even if it's just serving, cleaning very well, you know, the best place to practice it is the house of God. So once you discover a talent, and for, so it's best to start with the children as well. So if you have a child and you discover that this child likes to do A, B, C, D, you just try and encourage that talent through church and then see how it ends up. Uh, that's what I think. So thank you very much. That's, that's really helpful. Um, but there's another twist to this one too. I think that's the one that keeps a lot of us away. We are actually afraid. We are not afraid. It, it's not doing it that we are afraid. It's, it's not doing it well. You know, and, and 
especially if it's, if it's one of those talents where you have to be in front of everybody. You get it? So I don't know if maybe, um, Vero, you want to help us. How, how, how would you encourage someone who is sitting at home and believes she can sing? Look, she believes <laughs> she can sing, but it's like if I stand here and I forget the line or I sing a different thing, the key is going this way and I'm going that way, I, I don't think I can come and stand here again and try again. Yes, uh, sometimes it happens, but when you get people to encourage you that the next time you do it again, and even when we are rehearsing and you are not getting your part very well, sometimes you even feel bad that you are not getting your part very well, but the leaders, uh, part leaders encourage you to push further so that you can get that confidence to stand in front of Because maybe if you are a tenor singer or auto singer and your co-part singers are not around and you are alone, you need to build up that confidence to sing alone because they are not there. You are the only person going to sing that part. So what I would I say is when you get people to encourage you to can build your confidence to come and stand in front and do the singing. So um, advising and encouraging each other too helps a lot. Okay. Um, one, one other thing before we move away from this subject. What about those of us who were fine coming to church? Uh, nothing has really popped up in our hearts that we can maybe even pack chairs or sweep or sing. I've never envied anybody who stands here to sing. I don't envy the one who comes to stand here and is the service leader. I'm not even interested in being a lay reader. But every Sunday, there's an announcement. Oh, join a group, join a group, join a group. How would we encourage others to open up and try to find um, where their talents are? You get it. I don't know if I'm making sense. It's as if for some of us, um, we don't see any need that we can actually meet. There are already people singing. That's one. There are already people who are service leaders, lay readers. Every Sunday when I come, the place is done. It means somebody did it. I'm fine. I'm just happy being in the pews. But we all know or we are being told every Sunday, there's something you can do, there's something you can do, there's something you can do. So how would we encourage those of us who, well, for one reason or the other, we, we just don't seem to see anywhere we can fill? I think uh, what we need to be doing to encourage others is, first of all, in the house of God, there are many works. As you said, there are so many departments. So. With time, when people are in a particular department, they become very used to the department, and the efficiency of the department always comes down. So you always good that you need the new faces who will be oh, able to okay. come in. And there are various departments, as I said, you can do train, the car parking attendant, the excuse me, the evangelism, the there are so many, the multimedia. Uh, department there. So with all this department, definitely you should be able to find your interest in where you belong. And that will happen if the authorities or the church leaders are able to be very specific on where that they need more hands in. Because as for the work, we always have to get more hands to complete it. Since people are going, we need people in. So definitely, yes, you might have a talent, you are scared, or you don't even know where to start it from. But when you are being encouraged by the man of God or your leaders in the church, you will, be definitely, you will definitely have an interest. As my sister already said, that sometimes you have to be coerced to <laughs> do what, yes you, you, yes, you might love doing it, but initially you don't even know that that's what you really love. So sometimes when people coerce you, it helps you a lot. When you go in there, you find the environment very friendly and you'll be able to you know, use your talent very well to serve the people of God. So I think that uh, we should always 
let people know that there are more, we need more hands in other departments of the church, and that will help people to really come out and, and serve. Okay, thank I'll, you. I would like to use myself as an example. Um, apart from singing, I try to join uh, the prayer group and all that, but sometimes I get scared because maybe one day they'll tell me to go and lead prayer meeting or something. But <laughs> <laughs> nobody did. Nobody did. But one day I was called to come and lead prayer meeting. Um, I get shaking. You know, sometimes we need to involve people who are not even in the group. In most of the group, when you involve people, then they will, maybe the person can tell you, I can't do it. That's where you get the chance to convince that person or encourage that person to come and do it. The moment the person starts from day one, yes, she, he or she will accept that, yes, I can do it. I tried leading prayer meeting once. There I told myself, I, I've done it once. I know I can do it again. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, about, um, it's like you encouraging the person to do it. There are more people out there who try to join a group, but they don't have the courage to step forward. So we have to, or the leaders of the church have to involve people to do certain things in the church, and I'm sure they will use their talent in the church. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there's a question from our families online, and they're saying, um, we thank God for this wonderful session. How are the families shining with their financial lives as a family? Okay, so who would like to tackle this one first? Dr. Van der Poy. Um, okay. So I think just just like how you have ups and downs in life, you have ups and downs when it comes to finances. But um, I believe that as a family, as a, a husband and a wife, you sit down and you have a plan. You usually have a plan of um, how you're going to spend your money, how you're going to divide it, who's doing what. Of course, sometimes things, things happen. Things happen that you haven't planned for that may shake your finances. Things that um, may cause maybe you to be reliant on one person more than the other. But even through those times, you have to, should I say, continue to trust in God. So, um, I'll give an example. So there was, a, there was a time, like personally, when we had a few financial issues and it, it, it set us back for a couple of years. But then it also, it also makes you realize that when you're making the vow of for richer, for poorer, <laughs> it is real. It's, it, I mean, when we stand there and we, we make we make the vow. I think sometimes, you know, at the altar, you assume that everything will be fine. Everything will go well. But life in itself is not like that. Every day you have challenges, you have ups, you have downs. But at the end of the day, you must have each other's back. No matter what comes your way, with God being the center of it all. And the, and the thing to remember is that God is in control. God sees what you are going through. God knows that you are having hard times. And he will not let you go through something that he doesn't think that you can't handle. Sometimes you've made a mistake. You've done something wrong, and so what you're going through is a consequence of your mistake. As much as it's a mistake, there's still a learning point from it. There's something that God wants you to learn from. He wants you to build a strength. He wants you to recognize that this thing that you're doing, you have to stop it, or this is the way that you should go. But at the end of it all, it's God that keeps you going strong. And you have to learn how to communicate. You have to learn how to compromise. You have to learn how to be there for each other. It's, it's, I, I don't know. I mean, every, everybody's financial um, circumstances are different. But like I said, as a couple, you have to sit down and decide how it is that you want yours to work. Everybody has what's, 
what will be um, suitable for them in their circumstances. So you have to be able to be able to communicate and come to that decision as a, as a, as a unit. McCarthy? Yes, um, wh wh when it comes to uh, financial issues, it's always a, a, a thorny issue. In fact, Georgia and myself do um, some marriage counseling and sometimes the couples come up with issues and you realize the root cause is how they are handling money. And you realize that's why the marriage is breaking down because they are not able to understand well. Uh, Dr. Matoko said that she has a plan with her husband, that they will sit and plan. I think that that is the first thing, that you must have a foundational plan for money in your marriage. And for Georgia and myself, our foundational plan for money in our marriage is that all the money belongs to both of us. <laughs> Michael doesn't have any money. Georgia doesn't have any money. And it is 100% on each side. It has really, 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 really shown itself to be a good principle for us. So uh, let, me, let me trace it for the, the, the past, okay, our entire married life. There were times when um, either of us was not earning any money. There were times when, especially when we started Divine Christian School, Georgia wasn't earning a salary because the school wasn't even making money. So there was even no way to pay um, salary for her. Um, it grew. We got to another point. Um, our sister also mentioned crisis. I also had a crisis where I was not earning any money. And this was for a number of years. Wow. At that time, uh, Jordan had started earning money. And so it, it balanced. And different ups and downs where it seemed as if one person was up and the other was down. But we didn't have that problem of one person being up and another person being down because the money actually belonged to both of us. So it was a total sum of our, is it gross or net? <laughs> <laughs> Please, no accountant should come and correct me. <laughs> the, the total sum of the money um, was what was important. Okay, so how much do we have and how, what do we budget with this? And then that helps you in your planning. That helps you in your expectation. That helps you in your trust because nobody's suspecting that you're hiding something. Nobody's insisting that you buy the thing because they know that we, we all know what is in the kitty. And so we understand and are able to um, work on the problems together. And it has really helped us to weather the storms of the financial storms of marriage. Um, <laughs> Uh, as you go along, I mean, uh, those with younger children, some of the problems are buying pampers. Hmm. And that was the thing that I thank God for. <laughs> that I, I, had to st I was able to stop buying pampers because that was a financial drain. You know, especially when they call you at 9 p.m. and say that when you are coming home, <laughs> um, buy pampers at 9 p.m. Then you, you know what being a father is and you, do, you have only 20 CDs in your pocket. You, you, you know. Um, so having an understanding that this was our money rather than her money and my money, I think really helped us. And we've never had any, the only marriage quarrel we've had about money is that we need more. <laughs> <laughs> That's really the only, only problem, but not any other thing that, you know, will pull us apart. So the money thing, I think it rather pulled us closer together rather than pulling us apart. But we see a lot of couples, now they are struggling because the man says he's bringing all the money and she's not bringing any money. So anything he says she should take. Or the opposite way, the woman is bringing all the money, the man is not bringing any money. So now anything the woman says the man should take. How will your marriage thrive in, in that environment? And that may just be temporary. If today I'm not earning anything, what shows that in 10 years I'll still not be earning anything? I may be earning much mm -hmm. more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that our attitude to money should be guided. For us, this has worked. If it works for you too, it will be a, worth a try. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for sharing that. Um, at this point, I want to ask all of us here, if anybody has a question, please let me know so that we get you a mic and then you can share or ask. Any questions, any reactions to any of the topics, anything that we've been discussing so far? Okay, so before we wrap up, I just have one small quick 
question I just want you to touch on. Um, Dr. Brownfield mentioned that he's had to be in Mali for some time, which is heavily dominated by Muslims, okay? And we are in a country where we have the two faiths. I'm just curious to know, has any of you here, um, Christelle, your children, or even you, has any of you ever had to sort of stand up for your faith? Has anybody walked up to you and asked you, are you Christian? Why are you Christian? Has it ever happened to you? Yeah, okay, so Nelma is going to help us out. Okay, so it's not like someone has come to me and asked me the direct question, like, why are you a Christian or something? But maybe, okay, there's some of my class has asked me, oh, why don't you listen to certain music? Like, maybe they are all listening to a secular artist, and they're like, oh, why don't you listen to it? And, and I'm like, that's not how, like, that's not how I was trained. Like, I don't, in those types, type of music does not appeal to me. And I think that's, I think that's the only ch um, challenge that I've encountered with this question, but not a direct question where, oh, why are you a Christian or something like that? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. And picking off her dimension, I also come back to that. That um, have you ever had to sort of stand up for your faith, not just in the religious setting, but with the example she gave, for instance, we all work together in the company. We are all doing something together. <laughs> you seem to be the only one who doesn't agree with what we are doing just because you say you have some principles. Has it ever happened to you, and how have you handled it? I'll just invite maybe one or two reactions. Any? Okay, um, maybe an example I remember is um, um, uh, somebody passed the comment that um, Madam no, no kwa no be call heaven. And this was because you know, with the, the BEC exams, um, the term is that as a, it's a game. And if you don't know how to play the game, um, passing, your students passing will become difficult. And I told them that I don't know how to play that game and I'm not going to learn how to play that game. And a parent goes by, uh, madam no, no heaven. So I don't know whether that answers the question. So I, I wanted you to shed light on what it meant to stand up for your faith because for many of us, we face it. You get it, as families, as individuals, we face it wherever we go. But sometimes we end up going with everybody else just because it's a bit difficult for us. So I just wanted encouragement from there. So for me, what, what has kept me going is um, I always look at what, oh, how God sees it. You know, I, I have vowed that I will not do certain things and I'm principled when it comes to certain things. And so I look at what God will say, not necessarily what people will say. Yeah. Thank you very much. Please let's put our hands together for our families. They've been very wonderful, very supportive. Thank you so much for opening up to your lives, what you face, what, how you've dealt with all the things that have come as you next week, we're going to continue our family month, but we're going to be looking at let your light shine in your vocation. It's also another conversation with the Rich Church school teachers. We are inviting everybody to be here. Let's have an interaction with them. Let's also understand that line of being a Christian. Okay, so thank you so much for coming. And you've been such a wonderful group. And thanks so much for your support. We're going to please rise and, and then let's probe our offer tree and let's also. Okay, Reverend Ankama has stepped out briefly, but then we'll share the grace and then we'll be on our way. Okay. Father, we thank you for what we've been able to bring to you. Thank you for the blessings you have given to us, the wisdom that we have picked off our friends and our fellow family members. We know that this is a family unit. We are one, and it is in your spirit that we'll continue to remain as one. Lord, we seek your face and your grace to keep us going and coming every day. And we pray that what we have learned here, we will practice them. We will see the effects and the results of these things. And we will know that indeed your word is true. It has never been by our strength, never been by our understanding. We have learned that indeed you have held 
us from the very beginning. And with you, we can do far more. Thank you for this gathering. Thank you for this session. As we leave and go to our various homes, we trust that you will be with us and we will all have a good report of ourselves in the morning. Thank you very much in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All too soon we've come to the end of this session. Um, I'm sure we'll have to do this again sometime in the future, but it's been very, very insightful, and I hope you've all been blessed. Amen. Amen. All right, so thank you and good night.